Hey, good morning, everyone. That is a nice, warm good morning. I love that. It's a great, actually, it's an incredible day to be in church. And it's good to look out and see all of you here together today, worshiping the Lord together. Wasn't the orchestra great? So good. Since the 4th of July kind of fits between two weekends, we'll also be doing some patriotic music next week. Don't miss that. We're going to be honoring our, our service members, and Phil Haig is going to be playing a couple patriotic songs next week on his harmonica, so don't miss that. Hey, I want to say to everyone joining us online, great to see you. Everyone wave. I'm waving this morning, and you know who I'm waving to right now, so... I, it's hard for me. I'm imagining all the people watching online, and I can't, I can't even begin to imagine everybody, but uh, it is incredible to know that we have a couple hundred people joining us even in this service this morning. So, I have a lot to say. I've got pages of notes, and I decided this morning when I woke up at 2.30 and I couldn't fall back to sleep, I might use some of it. But I've invited some people to come and, and join me. So I want, I want uh, Erica to come. And uh, then I'm going to ask Pastor Luke to follow her. And then I'm going to ask Barry and Melissa Thomas to follow him. And we are going to share some incredible stories of what God is doing. This week has been an incredible week. We had VBS all week long. And uh, Eric is going to tell us a little bit about that, and then Pastor Luke's going to share about the team that went to El Salvador. Well, Jesus loves little children. Amen. And so does New Hope. What a great family we have. And VBS is just a perfect depiction of family because 170, 170 people from middle school age all the way up to Pastor Weaver. Um, <laughs> Sorry, I'm tired. <laughs> um, yes, I begged him to help out of desperation one night. Um, but anyway, all of the 170 people gave up time after some of you working all day long, came and invested in children. And that's what we were made to do, right? To see others come to know, know the Lord. So if you had attended VBS, you would have seen many small group leaders in circles with children, praying with them, praying for them, helping to instill the love of Jesus. And it was just a beautiful picture. Um, so if, I would like to just take a second and say, if you helped in any way with VBS, whether it was prepping materials or decorating or coming during VBS, would you please stand? I want everybody just to see what 170 looks like. Although I didn't tell you I was doing this, so... I think a lot of people will be in another service too. But it was an amazing time. We had between the um, three-year-olds and fifth graders, we had right at 300 children. And some of them were here a day or two, some were here every day, but no doubt each one left knowing that the people of New Hope love them, care about them, and that Jesus loves them too. So the bottom line of the whole week was Jesus is a great reason to have a party, and everyone is invited. It was amazing. Um, this picture up here shows, um, actually this is from Tuesday night, um, many, many children responded to Jesus and spent time at the altar asking him to be their Lord and Savior, and worshiping together. And if you were there, you know that worship time looked like many adults worshiping the Lord and many children right alongside. Again, it's a picture of family. So thank you for all that you did, and thank you for involving your children. Um, it was a great week. So we had an incredible team of youth and adults, and I asked Pastor Luke just to give a couple highlights of the week uh, that they spent in El Salvador. It's, uh, it's hard to, to limit it uh, down, but tonight I want to remind you that our team will be sharing testimonies tonight at service. And so please, I encourage you to come back. Your faith will be strengthened, and I believe that 
God's going to do some healing work or some mighty work at the altar tonight. Our kids are fired up and ready to pray for you. So uh, we took a team of 76. Yes, you heard that right. Yes, we all made it back in Jesus' name. Uh, we had three, three, we had to split into three different buses worth of ministry because we all didn't fit. And we went around different places in the country and did programs, uh, evangelism, outreach, and then just got to pray for so many people. And uh, we did 33 programs, almost a thousand people came to know Jesus, made a, we count them. Isn't that amazing? A uh, couple highlights. From the trip, there was a, uh, I believe, a six or seven year old girl that was very hard of hearing. You had to be almost touching her ear to talk to her, and that's how her mom would communicate. Uh, and we prayed for her, and we prayed for her three times, and each time one of our nationals stepped farther away and whispered to her to repeat something, and next thing you know, she's across the room whispering to this girl, and she's weeping, crying, this little girl, totally healed of her hearing problems, totally healed. And her mom, her mom was so impacted that she said, I got stuff going on, pray for me right now. I want in on that. It was pretty powerful. Uh, we had another story of our team praying over, uh, uh, I believe it was a, a young man that, or a middle-aged man that you could physically see his eye problems, that he was, he was near blind and his eyes almost had like scales on them. And they prayed for him and he opened his eyes and they said they literally just washed uh, watched the wa the white of his eyes kind of like come back to life and the scales fall away and he was jumping up rejoicing. I mean, we're talking biblical. The Lord is doing stuff and moving and working. Isn't that amazing? And uh, what's humbling for me as a youth pastor, uh, we have the best leadership team, best adult leadership team. We couldn't have done it without them, but it was so awesome to see our students, our students, freshmen, to recent graduates, step up in faith and say, God, I am full of your Holy Spirit and I'm going out commanding uh, to, or being an obedient to what you're commanding us to do. And they're praying for people, they're giving words of wisdom. They're, they're, I mean, just loving on kids, loving on family members. I'm so proud of our students. We had an absolutely incredible trip. It just keeps getting better and better. So thanks for supporting. I know you a lot of guys bought uh, a lot of cookies over the past couple months from the lobby. So. It paid off. We had an amazing trip. So please come back here some more tonight. God is so good. Amen. And I'm assuming we'll be praying for people tonight too. Don't ever underestimate the power of testimony. What God is doing in your life, no matter how small or big, God is using your story and he will use your story. Your testimony is powerful and impactful. Your testimony about God's healing can encourage the sick. Your testimony about God bringing you through can help people and encourage them who are going through troubles themselves. And your testimony of a victory that God has brought in your life will help those who are struggling. This is Barry and Melissa Thomas, and I'm going to hand the mic to these guys. This is a little bit of, a, of, a, of an emotional story. So last Sunday, they were coming to church, the 11 o'clock service, on their motorcycle. And uh, it is absolutely miraculous that these guys are standing on the stage with us today. So I want you to maybe step right up here. You may need to use this to lean on. I'm going to let them tell you their story. I'm not a public speaker, so this is testimony in itself that I'm standing up here talking to you. <laughs> I was doing really good until he said something about people online watching, so thanks for that. Just add a couple hundred more people. <laughs> Barry so, is a teacher, so he's used to being in front of people, just not this yeah, many. Just not this many. <laughs> um, so my name is Barry Thomas, and this is my wife, Melissa. Um, as Pastor Jeff said, we're here to give testimony. After, after hearing that testimony, it's kind of hard to follow, but, you know, we serve such an amazing God. Um, we, were, uh, we were on our way here last Sunday. Um, as he said, on a motorcycle, and we were in an accident that most people um, don't walk away from, um, and God was there. You know, we hear our pastors all the time talking about, you know, trusting the plan for us, and, and I believe that, but for the longest time, I don't think I ever trusted it until last Sunday, because this is a story that goes back long before the accident on Sunday, and it goes back to when we first bought that motorcycle right there, 
Um, we actually had taken a motorcycle trip out to the Black Hills on a different motorcycle. Um, and we'd spend about three days there and Melissa was complaining the whole time about the seat that was on it and that we should get a new seat. And, you know, to her credit, it was kind of small and it was probably uncomfortable. So it was about the third day of our vacation. We were um, going to go up to Sturgis and we were on our way up to Sturgis and there was a detour and it detoured us right into Black Hills Harley Davidson. <laughs> That's a true story. <laughs> so, <laughs> True story. So we, she's like, hey, we can go look for a new seat. And okay, so we go in and we're going around and we end up in this big tent with all these motorcycles and a salesman comes up to us and he's like, well, what are you looking for? And I'm like, nothing. <laughs> and Melissa's like, well, he wants this and this and this and this. And I'm like, shut up. <laughs> and he takes us over to this bike and it's one of the most amazing bikes I've ever seen and it had everything we wanted. And so long story short, we ended up driving off and I always say this, you know, Melissa got her seat, it just happened to come with a new motorcycle for me. <laughs> um, so we took Melissa's seat all the way up to Sturgis and we were at Sturgis and the day this picture was taken, we were actually outside the National Motorcycle Museum and we go inside and I see this guy and he has a shirt on that says Ankeny Phil, or a, Phil's in, or Indian Phil's Ankeny, Iowa. And I was like, really? Um, so we had a conversation. It turns out he's part of the Christian Motorcycle Club and he goes to all these different places um, and prays for people and talks about Jesus. And he asked if we could pray for my bike. And we weren't done with the museum yet. And he says, don't worry about it. We'll go, we'll go out and uh, pray for it. And we did the museum, I totally forgot about it, and I come outside and on the ignition is this little packet, this little Ziploc bag, and in it was this little beads, beaded angel, and a little card that said, this isn't a real angel, angels are more powerful, but this is, is for you to basically remember that you have a guardian angel when you're riding this motorcycle. So fast forward to last Sunday, we're on our way here, and we just got off of 141, that little section between 141 and 86th Street. And a woman in an SUV was two lanes over to the left and came all of a sudden three lanes right towards us. I had no time to do anything. I had my foot on the brake, but I didn't have time to really even push it hard um, before I saw her come all the way over the shoulder. I, had, I was on the shoulder about as far as I could get. And we hit her going 65 miles an hour. I remember right before we hit her, I said to myself in that, that millisecond, I said, oh Jesus. And I know that he wrapped us up at that moment because we hit her, we bounced off of the car, we went down into the ditch. I still don't know how we ended up off of the motorcycle, but somewhere in the midst of it, we ended up off the motorcycle. We rolled a few times, and I remember thinking about Melissa first, and I asked her if she was okay, and she said, yeah, she's okay. And she's like, where's your phone? Uh, and I, she's like, I wanna call 911. And she grabbed my phone, she's like, hey, use your phone, because I don't know where mine is. It's in the motorcycle, and we have no idea where that is. And so while she's on the phone with 911, Something compelled me and said, hey, you need to get up. I'm like, okay. Um, so I got up and I could see the, the car that we hit. It, they actually stayed, thank goodness. Um, and I see this packet of paperwork and it looked like you had just taken it and pulled it out and just ever so gently just placed it all together in that bundle. And in that bundle was the registration the insurance and that card. God is so amazing. We hit a car at 65 miles an hour, went into the ditch, rolled. Now you gotta think too, if you've ever been by that particular spot, there's telephone poles or there's light poles, there's those little reflector poles. We managed to miss all of that, go down in the ditch, roll a few times. I have a broken rib, I have a lung contusion, we have bones that are, most of like had a tailbone that's really, really sore. 
We got scrapes and cuts all over the place, but we walked away. God is good, amazingly good. This is the kind of accident that people don't walk away from. We love you guys. I got my mic back on. Hey, while we're sharing testimonies, I want Connor, if he would just stand up right where he's at. A week and a half ago, Connor Hayner sustained an injury on the trampoline with his little girls. His L1 vertebrae, I've never heard of this, exploded, burst. Didn't crack, didn't break, it burst. So you don't have an L1 vertebrae. They found it all, okay. But this, this is the amazing thing. That was a week and a half ago. He's wearing a brace, he's gonna be wearing a brace. But this guy shouldn't be standing probably shouldn't be walking, but God had his hand on his life, and there's a miracle story going on in this event. Amazing that all the shrapnel from that, I don't know how that works, but it didn't touch any of the nerves, and there's no paralysis, nothing. So praise God for his hand on. Your testimony is powerful. So we're in a series in Genesis, and (laughs) can't even mention a book of the Bible without people going crazy. You have no idea where I'm going yet, and you've already cheered, but uh, I, I don't have enough time, and I felt like it was worthwhile for us to take some time to share that, because here's the deal. There is, there is miracle stories happening all around us, and God is working in and using all kinds of situations all kinds of people and circumstances to accomplish his, his will, his plans, and his purposes. Not always is the story so nice and neat. I mean, we're going to hear a story today as we continue to talk about Joseph. Things weren't just happening in his life necessarily. It seemed like one tragedy after another, one difficult situation, and then, then more bad news. Today, when we pick up Joseph's story in, in Genesis 41, um, we're going we're gonna to see the, the full circle of the dream that we read about back in Genesis 37. I want to read several verses of Scripture. I just want to make a few comments today. And I'm, trust me, I'm just trying to, trying to think where I'm going. Genesis 41, verse 37, or verse 41, I mean, 41, 41. Last week when we left off of Joseph's story, Joseph had interpreted the dreams of the cupbearer and the baker in prison. For some reason, Pharaoh had been angry with them and threw them into prison. Remember, those guys had dreams and they came to Joseph and Joseph gave the interpretation of their dreams. It didn't go so well for the baker. His story was that he would be impaled on a stick. The cupbearer, however, you know, had a a blessing that in three days he was going to be restored to his position. And Joseph simply asked him, hey, and when the good news happens to you and you leave, put in a good word for me. Because I've been hanging out here in this prison, and I don't know how many years it's been at this point, but he's been hanging out in the prison and he says, listen, I'm here for a crime I didn't commit. I didn't do anything wrong. So put in a good word. The incredible thing with that that story is that as soon as the cupbearer left, it said that he forgot all about Joseph. And it wasn't until two years later that Pharaoh had a dream. And all of a sudden it triggered in his mind, hey, there was that guy in prison that told my dream to, to the detail. And so he goes and tells Pharaoh finally two years later, hey, there's this guy Joseph. And instantly he brings him into the palace, interviews him. Joseph interprets his dream. And just like in a moment almost, in that day, Joseph went from being in prison to being elevated to second in command in all of Egypt. 
So we pick it up in verse 41. Pharaoh said to Joseph, I hereby put you in charge of the entire land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh removed his signet ring from his hand and placed it on Joseph's finger. He dressed him in fine linen clothing and hung a gold chain around his neck. And then he had Joseph ride in the chariot reserved for his second in command. And wherever Joseph went, the command was shouted, kneel down. So Pharaoh put Joseph in charge of all Egypt. And Pharaoh said to him, I am Pharaoh, but no one will lift a hand or foot in the entire land of Egypt without your approval. Then Pharaoh gave Joseph a new Egyptian name, Zaphoneth Paneah, which uh, he also gave him a wife whose name was Asenath. She was the daughter of Potiphar, the priest of An. So Joseph took charge of the entire land of Egypt. He was 30 years old when he began serving in the court of Pharaoh. The Bible tells us back in 37, he was 17 years old when God gave him the dreams. Now he's 30. So it's 13 years after he was sold into slavery that now he stands in Pharaoh's palace. He was 30 years old when he began serving in the court of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. And when Joseph left Pharaoh's presence, he inspected the entire land of Egypt. As predicted, for seven years, this was the, this was the dream, seven years of bumper crops. During those years, Joseph gathered all the crops grown in Egypt and stored the grain from the surrounding fields in the cities. He piled up huge amounts of grain like sand on the seashore. Finally, he stopped keeping records because there was too much to measure. During this time before the first of the famine years, two sons were born to Joseph and his wife, Asenath, the daughter of Potiphar, the priest of An. Joseph named his older son Manasseh, for he said, God has made me forget all my troubles and everyone in my father's family. The name Manasseh sounds like the word for forget. God has helped me to forget all my troubles. Joseph named his second son Ephraim, for he said, God has made me fruitful in this land of my grief. Ephraim means fruitful. So every time he called his boys, he's reminding himself of what he forgot in his past and the fruitfulness that God made him in this land of his grief. At last, the seven years of bumper crops throughout the land of Egypt came to an end. Then the seven years of famine began, just as Joseph had predicted. The famine also struck all the surrounding countries, but throughout Egypt there was plenty of food. Eventually, however, the famine spread throughout the land of Egypt as well. And when the people cried out to Pharaoh for food, he told them, go to Joseph and do whatever he tells you. So with severe famine everywhere, Joseph opened up the storehouses and distributed grain to the Egyptians, for the famine was severe throughout the land of Egypt. And people from all around came to Egypt to buy grain from Joseph because the famine was so severe throughout the world. Chapter 42, when Joseph, or when Jacob heard that grain was available in Egypt, he said to his sons, why are you standing around looking at one another? I've heard there is grain in Egypt. Go down there and buy enough grain to keep us alive. Otherwise, we'll die. So Joseph's 10 older brothers went down to Egypt to buy grain. But Jacob wouldn't let Joseph's younger brother, Benjamin, go with them for fear some harm might come to him. So Jacob's sons arrived in Egypt along with the others to buy food, for the famine was in Canaan as well. Since Joseph was governor of all of Egypt and in charge of selling grain to all the people, it was to him that his brothers came. When they arrived... They bowed before him with their faces to the ground. Joseph recognized his brothers instantly, but he pretended to be a stranger and spoke harshly to them. Where are you from? He demanded. We're from the land of Canaan, they replied. We have come to buy food. Although Joseph recognized his brothers, they didn't recognize him. And he remembered the dreams he'd had about them many years before. All of a sudden, he remembers the dream. What was the dream? Go back to chapter 37. This was the dream that started this whole story. Verse 5, one night Joseph had a dream. And when he told his brothers about it, they hated him more than ever. His brothers hated him. He was his father's favorite son. He had made him this beautiful coat, and they hated him. Listen to this dream, he said. We were out in the field tying up bundles of grain. Suddenly my bundle stood up 
and your bundles all gathered around and bowed low before mine. His brothers responded, so you think you will be our king, do you? Do you actually think you will reign over us? And they hated him all the more because of his dreams and the way that he talked about them. Soon Joseph had another dream, and again he told his brothers about it. Listen, I've, I've had another dream, he said. The sun, the moon, and 11 stars bowed low before me. This time he told the dream to his father as well as his brothers, but his father scolded him. What kind of dream is that? Will your mother and I and your brothers actually come and bow to the ground before you? But while his brothers were jealous of Joseph, his father wondered about what the dreams meant. So Joseph remembered the dreams. And now it's come full circle. The dream that he had in Canaan as a 17-year-old boy, now he's 30 years old, standing in charge of all of Egypt, and who shows up to buy green? Think with me for a minute. What was the last encounter Joseph had with these 10 brothers? They wanted to kill him. You go back and read the story, their plan was to take his life. Reuben the oldest, if it hadn't been for him stepping in saying, wait, this might be a little too much. Why don't we just throw him into a cistern? We can spread some blood on his coat and we'll let dad figure out whatever he wants, wants, wants to figure out. The scripture tells us that Reuben had intended to go back and rescue Joseph out of the, out of the cistern. But before he got back, the brothers had sold him. They decided, let's just sell him as a slave, and then his blood won't be on our hands. And where was that slave band going to? Egypt. I wonder if it had been in their minds just a little bit when Jacob said, go to Egypt, there's grain in Egypt. I wonder if just a little bit, it might have thought, the, the thought might have crossed their minds, what if, we, what if we run into Joseph? For all they knew, Joseph was dead. For all they knew, he was a slave somewhere, but they didn't know. This is 20 years after that event. He remembered the dreams he had had about them many years before. And he said to them, you are spies. You've come to see how vulnerable our land has become. No, my Lord, they exclaimed. Your servants have simply come to buy food. We are all brothers, members of the same family. We are honest men, sir. We are not spies. What do you think Joseph thought? Honest men. Honest men. After all I've been through, honest men would not be the term I would use for you guys. We're not spies. Yes, you are, Joseph insisted. You have come to see how vulnerable our land has become. Sir, they said, there are actually 12 of us. We, your servants, are all brothers, sons of a man living in the land of Canaan. Our youngest brother is back there with our father right now, and one of our brothers is no longer with us. Irony. But Joseph insisted, as I said, you were spies. This is how I will test your story. I swear by the life of Pharaoh that, I, that you will never leave Egypt unless your youngest brother comes here. One of you must go and get your brother. I'll keep the rest of you here in prison. And then we'll find out whether or not your story is true. By the life of Pharaoh, if it turns out that you don't have a younger brother, then I'll know that you are spies. Here's another thought that I'm thinking Joseph has in his mind. They did this to me. He has had no contact with them. He has no idea if they've done the same thing to Benjamin, his younger brother, both sons of Rachel. He has no idea. He has no idea if his dad's even alive. But he says, I'll need you to go. Bring your brother. If you don't bring him, then I'll know that you're spies. So Joseph put them all in prison for three days. I don't know what he had in mind unless he's just going, let me think a little bit here. Three days in prison is nothing compared to how long I've been in prison. But let me put them there. Put them in prison for three days, and on the third day, he said to them, I am a God-fearing man. Not what you would hear, imagine to hear from the leader of Egypt. I am a God-fearing man. If you do as I say, you will live. If you really are honest men, choose one of your brothers to remain in prison. The rest of you may go home with grain for your starving families, but you must bring back your youngest brother to me. This will prove that you are telling the truth, and you will not die. To this they agreed. 
Now there's a side conversation speaking among themselves. They said, clearly, we're being punished because of what we did to Joseph long ago. All of a sudden, they're remembering 20 years ago, we sold our brother. 20 years ago, we've been lying about this all this time. Dad doesn't even know. He thinks he was eaten by a wild animal. Surely, we're being, we're being punished for that. We saw his anguish when he pleaded for his life, but we wouldn't listen. That's why we're in this trouble. Didn't I tell you not to sin against the boy, Reuben asked, but you wouldn't listen. And now we have to answer for his blood. Of course, they didn't know that Joseph understood them because he had been speaking to them through an interpreter. He understood everything. Now he turned away from them and began to weep. He's getting the whole story. Now he's getting their perspective of what happened 20, 20 years ago. He turns away from them and began to weep. And when he regained his composure, he spoke to them again. Then he chose Simeon from among them and had him tied up right before their eyes. Joseph then ordered his servants to fill them in sacks with grain, but he also gave secret instructions to return each brother's payment at the top of his sack. He also gave them supplies for their journey home, so the brothers loaded up their donkeys with grain and headed for home. And there's a whole lot more to that story. But here's what I want to just kind of draw on today. Not all of our situations, our lives, our circumstances, you know, Joseph... Joseph was a young man who feared God. Joseph was a young man of integrity, of sexual purity, of honesty. He loved and followed God. But here's what we find out. Even though you do everything right, even though you follow God, doesn't mean that everything is going to turn out right in your life. I think we probably all have experienced those circumstances. Just doing the right thing doesn't mean everything's going to turn out perfect, at least according to our perspective. But everything that God does, every plan that God makes is good and has a purpose. Listen to this. God is doing something far greater in our lives than we could ever imagine. Barry and Melissa, God was doing something in your lives way before this accident. That guardian angel, that prayer over your bike. It wasn't that little bead that saved you. It was the hand of God that saved you. But it was, it was put into place way, way before this. Joseph's story has been told now for, we've gotten 20 years of this history. Nothing seems to go right for Joseph, but God is doing something far greater. We see that in his, lives, in, in his life. And I can tell you that if we would have that kind of a God view of our lives, even though everything seems to be falling apart or nothing seems to work out or we're just not where we wanted to be or we thought we should be at this time, and it seems like we, we go after struggle after struggle, battle after battle, Time after time, things aren't always, like we might just be eking out an existence. Why are, why are we not experiencing the miraculous things in our life? How do we not know that we're experiencing the miraculous things? How do we not know that we've missed many accidents that could have happened had we been there just five seconds sooner or five seconds later? God is doing something in our lives greater than we could ever imagine Isaiah 55, verse 8 and 9, God says, My thoughts are nothing like your thoughts, and my ways are far beyond anything you could imagine. For just as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways. My thoughts higher than your thoughts. Listen, you might get irritated because every message that I preach, I almost always share this scripture, but it's true. Romans 8, 28, that says, We know, we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. God's plans, God's ways, God's thoughts, his purposes are so much higher, always better than ours. We know that scripture says these things, but do we really truly believe it? Is God working things together for good? Listen, Proverbs 16, 9, we can make our plans, but the Lord determines our steps. Proverbs 19, 21, many are the plans in a man's heart, but it is the Lord's purpose that prevails. 
Psalm 33, 11, the Lord's plans stand firm forever. His intentions can never be shaken. Jeremiah 29, 11, for I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you, not to harm you, to give you a hope and a future. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says, trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Don't lean on your own understanding. Acknowledge me in all your ways, and I will direct your paths. God doesn't operate the same way we do. He doesn't think like we think. His ways are beyond what we can even comprehend. And here's what I can tell you. The story of your life is constantly being written by the hand of God. And if we will trust him and look to him, you can spend 20 years as a slave and in prison, and in a moment, everything changes. I don't know what your story is. We've shared some miraculous stories here. Here's what I can tell you. There are people here who need a touch from God. I didn't mention earlier, but Jolene Stevenson is having surgery tomorrow to remove a blood clot from a device in her heart. Doctors at Mayo have never seen a blood clot this big. That seems impossible. And you say, but she's at Mayo. They have great doctors there. But she has a God who's even greater than the doctors at Mayo. And that's the story. God is working in our lives and whether we realize it or not, that story is a, is a, is a powerful story. When things don't work out quite like we think they should, it is so tempting for us to to, to want to give up, to throw in the towel. I've been telling you guys, giving you updates of our youngest son, Ethan, who is, who is in the military. He's in the army at basic training. Five and a half weeks into basic training, he broke his foot. He's been out for four weeks. His group, his battalion is getting ready to graduate in a week and a half. He's not going to be graduating because he's been out for four weeks and could be out for three more months. And listening to his story on his end for the, just a few minutes that we get to talk to him once a week, he gets so down and discouraged. And I said to him, Ethan, you see, because his life, he came back to Jesus before he went to, went to basic training. I said, Ethan, here's the deal. I don't know, I can't tell you how this is gonna work out, but I will promise you I will promise you that somewhere down the line, somewhere a few months, a few years from now, you're going to look back to this time and say, had that not happened in my life, I wouldn't be right here where I'm at. We all have those kind of stories, that kind of perspective. If it hadn't have been for this tragic thing that happened or this circumstance that didn't seem to work out like I thought it should, if it hadn't been for that, I wouldn't be here. And I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing. I wouldn't be experiencing what I'm experiencing. And you're going, I wish I wasn't experiencing all of this. It's not good. Hold on. Because this isn't our home. Pastor Luke shared it in his testimony or in his prayer today. We're citizens of of a different world. We're not living for this world. It's full of trouble. It's full of trials. It's full of heartache. But God is writing our story. And we have so much to put our hope and trust in him. He's got such great plans for us. I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. To prosper you. Not to harm you. To give you a future and a hope. I have no idea how much time I was going to use here this morning. And I had really no idea what I was going to share with you. But here's what I feel led to do. This morning, if you are in difficult circumstances... Maybe you need healing. Maybe you just need intervention. Maybe you're discouraged. Your circumstances. Man, it just seems like it's enough to tread and keep your head above water. The struggle is real. Just can't seem to quite. If that's you today and you say, you know what, I just... I need God's reassurance. I need his comfort. I need his strength. I need his peace. I need his hope. I need his healing, his hand on my life. 
I need to know and be reminded that he is ordering my steps. I'm making plans as best I can, but God is the one who is directing my steps. He's leading the path. And I need to be reassured today that, 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 that God's doing that for me. If that's you today all across the room, I'm just going to ask you to stand where you are. I'm not going to ask you to come forward. We're just going to stand where you're at, and we're going to pray. You say, I need God today. Whatever, no matter how small the situation, no matter how enormous it is or it feels, sometimes it feels enormous, but it's just like this because God, God can change it in a moment, but maybe there's something. Maybe there's something. Here's, here's the thought. Joseph in prison, he interprets the dream of the cupbearer and says, hey, and when, you, when good things come to you, when you get out of here, put in a good word to Pharaoh. But that guy stinking forgot. Totally forgot. Got out of prison and it didn't even cross his mind until two years later. Listen, if he had gotten out two years before, he might have just gone on down the road. But he needed to interpret Pharaoh's dream in order to be in the position that Pharaoh put him in order to save his family and fulfill that dream. If you need prayer for anything right where you are, just stand up and we're going to pray. Would you just where you are, if you maybe just reach a hand out or if you know the, that person's name around you or if you don't. Pray for the guy with the yellow shirt. God knows who he is. Can we do this? Lord, today we pray for people all across this room. Lord, we don't know what you're doing, but our trust is in you. Our hope is in you. You are the God of the universe. There is nothing, God, that is impossible for you. And today, in each and every one of these situations, God, I pray that you build the hope, build the joy, build the encouragement. God, build the strength of, of each individual and each family, God, in, in that situation. Would you move and have your way? Would you provide in a way, God, that could only be you? Would you open our eyes, God, to see that you are working even when we can't see it. That what we see with our eyes isn't really the, the whole story. That there's more to that story. There's more going on. There's a bigger, a bigger perspective. And God, you have that perspective. You see us and you see where we're going. And you are ordering our steps. Thank you, God, that you don't always give us what we ask for. Because what we're asking for isn't the thing that we need but you know exactly what we need even before we ask. And so we pray, God, that you would move in every, every circumstance, every situation represented by those standing in this place. Would you build our faith to trust you, God? And when we're tempted to say, God, if you're so good, why do bad things happen? It may look bad to us, but God, we trust that you're working in every situation every circumstance that you've got our best in mind and you've got our back you've got our front you're going before us and coming behind us and you're surrounding us fill us with your hope fill us with your peace and your strength today in jesus name amen amen would you stand and let's